All right, and, and, and I... Am I okay? Yeah. Great, okay. Um, I'm, I just have one slide about coding by intent, but it, it's so related to test-driven development that I thought I would include that one slide. So most of the presentation is going to be about test-driven development. Um, my contact information is here. I'll also have it at the end. And also I have uh, some postcard size flyers for other resources, as well as a link to this presentation. And um, so the slides are available at that URL. So I, 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 I looked up the definition of test-driven development. I use Google a lot when preparing for presentations, and I, I didn't come up with any precise definition of it. Um, so I kind of merged a bunch and added some words. So it's a software development approach where independent automated unit tests are written um, before the code. So some, some, some key words here, independent. So uh, you got test A and B. Test B should not rely on test A. Automated. Um, and then unit tests. And uh, this one gets a little bit, the, the unit tests I'll talk about more. Um, I kind of fudged those rules before, and I think a little bit, and I think if you, uh, if you get into test-driven development, you might, you might start fudging it and do things that are a little bit bigger than a unit, or that some people might say, well, that's not a unit because it stores information in the database or whatever. So the key mnemonic, if you know, if you've done test-driven development at all, you've heard of red, green refactors. So these are the uh, main stages, uh, or I, actually I should say the main steps of test-driven development. And, uh, and the reason why I, I didn't say uh, stages is because typically you want to do very discrete um, tests. And so this all happens very quickly. Uh, in, in a typical environment, 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes for each, for each test. So you start out by writing a test before you've written any line of code. And that test automatically is going to fail. So uh, anyone want to shout out why the test will fail? Okay, I can't, I can't quite hear, but I think the, the answer is because, yes, there's no implementation. Yes. Uh, and that, that counts as a failure. So then you write a code to make the, the test pass. And in the simplest possible code that you can write, um, I've had, um, I, I uh, organize a user group where we, where we do test-driven development. And people who are new to it say, you want me to hard code a return value, which is like a you know a development no no, um, and uh, you know and, and the answer can be yes, and I'll show you an example of that. Um, so your code your code passes the test, great. So you've proven that your test works. That's one of the main purposes of the of the green phase. And then the next phase is red uh, is refactor. I don't quite like that color gray, but I, I picked it up off the internet with a reference there to where I got it from. And um, so there you take a look at your code and you say, OK, how can I improve it? And, and I'll talk about different ways of, of improving code. Um, but it might be uh, like kind of one example is, Let's say that you've got a, a statement, if, uh, if breed equals x, else if breed equals y, else if breed equals z, else if breed equals q, and you start starting to notice some repetition. So that's, that's a sign where maybe, okay, maybe it's time to refactor. And a, and a key with refactoring is, and this can be fudged a little bit, but 
you don't want to change existing functionality or make an enhancement. Now, sometimes when you refactor it, naturally will will handle test cases that you haven't written yet. Um, but, but basically, you don't want to make big changes in behavior. You're just trying to make the code work work as it did before. Um, so uh, that's that's that. Um, so to kind of illustrate this a little bit better, this is kind of a, um, a, a classic uh, example that's used when introducing people to test-driven development is the FizzBuzz example. So how many people here are familiar with the FizzBuzz game? Okay, so a good number of people are. So in FizzBuzz, it's a party game. Um, you, so you form a circle, first person says one, and the next player says the next number, which is two, um, except if it's divisible by, th by three, you say fizz, and if it's divisible by five, you say buzz. And so the requirement in this, in this uh, exercise would be to create a function that returns fizz buzz or fizz buzz, fizz buzz or fizz buzz, based on these rules. And actually, that's not a very good requirement because I realize here that I also otherwise I'm create a function. Oh, no, I do. It. That says that returns a number. Yeah. So let me talk about uh, using this. Let me talk about the red for a minute. So for a new system, as we said before, the first test fails because no code has been written. So here, this could be the first test that you write. You say assert equals fizzbuzz dot value of one equals one, um, and so this is this is uh, J unit syntax. And then you, so I'm not going to go to the green because I want to talk about red. So let's say that you you get that test to pass. And maybe you either just return one, you hard code it, or you return value, either, either one. Um, so uh, then you write your next test, which is value of three, and you expect to get back fizz. And so in this case, uh, you're not failing because the code doesn't exist, um, but you're failing because the wrong value is being returned back from the function. Now in the green in the green step, you write the simplest code to get it to pass. The point is basically to verify the test and to make it uh, and, you know and to make it quick so the so you don't want to overthink this stage. Um, and then again, I'm, again I'm using a, a, a you know a very simple example. Uh, so let's say that you already satisfied one, three, and six. Uh, and uh, that for the six, you put in some code which says if value is three or value equals six, return fizz. Um, and so you can see here there's some, there's some duplication. So this is an example of, of, of fizz. Maybe I don't know the modular function. Maybe I don't think of it. Uh, so you know, I just write this out because this is the quickest thing to do. So then we come to the refactor phase. So in the refactor phase, you improve the code without changing functionality. And here's where it gets a little bit, it's not 100% true, but uh, uh, so here I've got this duplicate value, value equals three or value equals six. That's some duplication because I'm saying value equals twice. And uh, for those of you who know Java, there, there, I already noticed there's a syntax error. It should be equals equals. But anyway. Um, and uh, you know, and imagine you had, you know, you, you tested for nine also, and you said or nine. Um, you know, then you, you, then you would start to see the duplication even more. So here, you notice the duplication. You say, OK, let me try to get rid of that duplication. And you say, okay, well, they're both divisible by three, so let me just change that to 
if uh, the remainder of value divided by three is zero, return fizz, else return value. You, you run all your tests again, they all pass, um, and you, you've refactored it, and because you have an extensive set of tests, everything passes. Uh, sorry, you can be confident in your refactoring. So test-driven development uh, kind of works hand-in-hand -hand with coding by intent. So if we come back to the tests, fizzbuzz.value of, so I've, this is saying I, I, I'm intending to have a function called value of, uh, or I'm intending to have a function that evaluates a number and uh, gives me back a value. So you don't, you don't write the function first. So uh, here's a slightly more complicated example of coding by intent. Uh, so let's say that I... Uh, um, I am uh, coding for scoring a bowling game. So I could create a games class and then create frames within that and make sure I've got all my getters and setters and everything like that. Um, but instead, what I want at the end is I just I write what I want. The, I, I think about the core logic. I want to say, okay, for every frame in a game, uh, I want to add up the score of all the different frames to get the total score. And then you can use your IDE, particularly if you're uh, using something like IntelliJ, VS Code less so. Um, so with IntelliJ, I haven't tried it with, with VS Code or, or Visual Studio or anything like that. I can just click on these different things and it says, well, frame, do, frame doesn't, uh, game.frames doesn't exist. You want me to create a class called game and you can say yes and it'll automatically generate the code for you as well as the getters and setters. So the idea is you, you start with your core logic and then have it, have it create all the supporting logic for you. Um, and even if you don't have something that, that generates it for you, it's still kind of useful to start, to start this way. Um, so here, here are our four principles of uh, good software design from Kent Beck, and he was kind of the uh, person who coined the term test-driven development and is, is well-respected in the software crafting um, world. So, and these are in order of priority. So the first most important thing about your software is that it passes your tests. And so if you're following test-driven development, you've got tests that execute all of your code. Um, the next is that it reveals intention. Um, so that it's expressive, clear, and understandable. And uh, Except for documenting the, the variables and return values of an API, in general, you don't want to have comments in your code. That's considered um, a, a bad practice. So your code um, should be obvious enough that by the names of your functions and methods and the structure that you've got, that you can follow the code without needing comments. Um, then these last two can be, in terms of priority, can be re reversed. Um, no duplication is the easier one to understand. Uh, so you've got code that does the same thing in multiple places. It's better to uh, reduce that duplication. And then fewest elements. And what Kent Beck means by this, I've seen it expressed in different words, but I think of it as um, no unused code. So um, with agile development, this is, this is more of an issue. Th this, this was a bigger issue in, in legacy code days, but it can still be an issue where you're saying, oh, well, you know, maybe they're going to want to have this in the future. So let me code this for something that might happen. Um, and, um, 
and then you get this big complicated thing to handle something that happened and it slows you down and there's a lot more code to read. So you want your, your code to be as uh, terse as possible. Terse not in terms of, uh, I, I don't mean in, in terms of being cryptic, but you, you want it to be as compact as possible. Um, and, you know, there, there, there are all these other solid principles which also relate to this, but I like this because this kind of covers what solid tries to get at. Uh, so if you've got something that, for those of you who are object-oriented, if you've got something with multiple responsibilities, well, that's, that's making it hard to real, reveal the intention of that object. So, there are some advocates of test-driven development that, that say, you know, this is the only way that you should develop. Um, I'm kind of trying to find the balance with that, so I don't necessarily agree with that. But it's, it's definitely a very powerful way of coding. So first of all, and when I first started, I was thinking, well, oh, that's great because you know that everything is tested. But that's not the real power of test-driven development. First of all, it encourages a simple modular design because you're writing something that right away is testable, so you have to understand the input values and, and what you expect to get back. And another really cool feature of it is that it's, it's, uh, you've got self-documenting functionality. Um, so, you know, if, if I put in these values, this is what I expect to get back, or you know, this function should do this. Um, and you've and you've got and you've got it recorded rather than in some spec. So, if your uh, if your test cases are written well, this can be very useful. I think the biggest thing, but it's, this kind of gets more into why it's great to have something that's well tested, is you can refactor with more confidence. Is kind of understating it. If you feel that you've got good code coverage, you can do pretty large refactorings with a lot of confidence. And I'll talk about where that refactoring may be is you shouldn't have so much confidence. Find defects earlier, good code coverage. Faster in the medium to long term is not faster in the short term. Like I'm doing uh, 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 online coding quizzes, and if I did test-driven development or need to develop something in half a day and I know it's going to be thrown out because it's a test, um, I wouldn't necessarily do test-driven development. So it requires upfront investment. Uh, complex systems will require mocking. I'll talk about that. If you think ahead, and this is kind of an issue with, that some people have with Agile, if you think ahead more rather than just the next two weeks, you might make better decisions, uh, but it, it's kind of proven that it, it, it's better to make that trade-off. But if you can spend a little bit of time thinking about, okay, you know, what are some requirements that are coming up? Maybe there's something I can do a little bit differently now. Um, the, the tests that you write require care, especially if your uh, systems are undergoing a lot of requirement change, and you might find your you, you might spend too much time on, on trivial test cases. All right, so let me talk about mocking for a minute. I think this will work. Uh, actually, let me ask, who, who here is familiar with the term in information technology, not in uh, when you're with your friends, mocking? Oh, good. That, seem, that actually seems like that's kind of a... It looks like that's bigger than how many people said test-driven development. So let me just explain it for those of you who didn't write it. So a mock object, and again, I, I, I had a hard time finding a precise definition of it. So um, a mock object is an object, and I want to say or method. I mean, a method is actually a type of object you can think of, but um, an object or method that is used to simulate behavior of another object. And it is used usually to isolate behavior and speed up execution. So let's say that you have A calls B, um, and you want to test A. Um, well, if, if you write a test for A, 
and it fails, you don't know if it, it maybe it's because of B or C. Or, or maybe it's really hard to create a scenario where the B function returns a, a specific set of values. Uh, you know, so what happens if B returns negative? Um, so in the mock, you would write a substitute function, and there's all sorts of tools that can that can help you sub dig in and, and substitute this uh, substitute in here. So an example down here at the bottom, um, a get, let's say that you wrote a get JSON function that retrieves complex JSON from a web service. And uh, here's an error here that should obviously be one line. Um, and you want to be able to mock a specific JSON being retrieved from that function. And you're doing, let's say that, let's say that B is the, is the, uh, is the, is the web server uh, that you, where you're calling to get the JSON. Um, so you can, you can mock the return results so you, that you just, instead of actually going out and calling the web server, you actually just return some predefined JSON. And wouldn't necessarily have to be predefined. You could, um, you can make that function as complex as you want. You could say, okay, well, if it sends me these type of values, return this JSON. Otherwise, do this. Um, and so, th so this has. Uh, in, in this case, the main advantage of it is performance, because if you're executing, say, a few hundred test cases, and you and you uh, have to go against the API, you know that might take time. Um, but it also has the advantage that uh, you don't need to worry about bugs over here, or if something doesn't work, you don't have to worry about if it's because of over here. You can say, I'm presuming I'm going to get JSON in this format. Okay. Let me just quickly check how I'm doing on time. 2.16. Okay, great. I'm doing fine. Whoops. Okay. Uh, so some challenges when you get into test-driven development. Um, I mentioned earlier rapid prototyping that will not be saved. Um, algorithmic, so I want to do something that's as fast as possible. Uh, or, uh, you know, so, so that's you want to improve something. You don't, you don't want something just to work and return the right results. You want it to return it as fast as possible. Um, I had an interesting conversation today with somebody at the break, and if anybody has any insights into this, this is great. But data analysis, that's also another challenging one because you're analyzing all this data. Are you analyzing it in the right way? Not does it return a number, right? Is there, are, are, you know, is there some factor you're not thinking of? Or, um, and then, uh, you know, if you if you're calling to the database or the API, um, that requires more work. And then, obviously, you need the support. You need to know how to do it. You need you don't necessarily need management support if you. If they're not over your your neck enough, and you know they, they say, okay, you've got two months to do this, um, you know you can try test-driven development even if they don't support it, as long as you think you can get the work done in the same amount of time. Um, okay. So test-driven. Test-driven development is not the whole story. So there's, uh, if you look up testing pyramid, there's, there are lots of people who've written about the testing pyramid. And it just means that there's, there's different levels of testing that take different amounts of effort. So the reason that unit tests are so good is because they're low cost to develop and they're fast to execute. And then at the very top level, you've got the UI tests. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons that those are difficult and fragile. And you know, there, 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 there are applications that make it better, but I've never seen an application. It, it's, it's always very tricky, because if you change a little something, 
in the user interface, it, it can often um, ruin all of your UI tests. So those are slow, and they're, um, and they're high cost to develop. And then you've got this middle layer, and there's all sorts of different strategies for the middle layer. Some, some companies will employ multiple of these strategies. Um, some will only do one. Um, some rely a little bit too much on just the unit tests. Um, and so you've got acceptance tests. You've got something called acceptance test-driven development. Um, so that one's kind of interesting. So with acceptance test-driven development, you're thinking of uh, kind of like a, a user scenario. And um, so you write an acceptance test. If I, if, you know, uh, if I uh, submit this bill, I expect to be able to pay it, something like that. Uh, and I, I'm more familiar with unit tests on the, on the bottom. And then you can write out 20 of these. And they actually execute code, and they'll fail because you haven't implemented them. And so you can use acceptance test-driven development to then drive test-driven test development. So you can take one of those and start writing the, the test-driven, the tests that will help that one succeed. And eventually that one, once you've implemented everything that you need, will turn green. Um, Behavioral-driven dri development is kind of similar. Um, you've got end-to-end -end testing, API testing, um, service testing, et cetera. Okay, so any questions about that? Okay, so this actually went a lot faster than I expected it to when I mocked this out, but this is, this is uh, the last slide, and then I'll take questions. So if you haven't tried TDD, um, I really recommend that you try it. Um, so you can you know, read more about it online. I can, um, you know, if, there's, if you want to ask me questions about it during the question period, I can, I can talk a little bit more about how you get started with it. Um, the, the, the big advantage to it is that if you follow it, it's going to, you're going to create highly high quality, maintainable, extensible, uh, and, and I'd, I'd like to say I'd like to add into there and refactorable code. <laughs> um, and then I run a, a user group called Boston Software Crafters. It's on Meetup. Oh yeah, I've got as I said before, I've got uh, some postcards back there with information about the Boston Software Crafters and about myself. Um, so you can check that out. I'd, I'd love to see you guys there. Um, here's my contact info and resources. So this is my email if you have questions, uh, my website, my LinkedIn profile. I'd love it if you connected to me on LinkedIn. Um, this is the meetup that I was talking about. Um, and then I also run, uh, I have a website for that meetup. Right now it says WordPress. Actually, I think, it's, I think that's wrong. I think it's bostonsoftwarecrafters.wordpress.com. Um, also, just a pitch for myself. Um, I've decided to, uh, to go back to work instead of consulting. So I'm looking for software engineering job opportunities, particularly at an agile environment where I can use test-driven development. Looking to collaborate with others for open source projects and I'm available for on-site training. And um, all the slides are available, again, at bit.ly slash ethantdd. And if you've forgotten your pen, again, I've got the, the, the postcard flyers at the back. So um, I can open it up to questions. Yes. Um, wait, hold, wait for the microphone. Um, hi, yeah. So I, I try to use TDD um, a bit in development, and I find it I can really get it to work for like simple use cases where I have a bug, um, I know exa exactly what's going on, the end result. I, I write the test, it fails, you know, red, green, refactor, that kind of thing. But the, the part that I struggle with it in like the real world is 
when it's a more complex like feature, sometimes I don't always know what the imp implementation is going to look like. Um, until Sorry, where it's what? Say that again. It, I don't. I don't know what the implementation is going to look like. Yeah. Until I start actually writing it. And, but So I don't know what test to write until I start writing the code, but it kind of breaks the TDD principle where you're supposed to write the test first. Do you have any like insight into that? Um, well, I mean, you know, as long as you're not, this is where I'm not a true TDD adherent, so I all the, t I, lots of times I do that, I'm like, okay, you know, and so and so maybe you write a little bit of code. The, I think the challenge is not to get too far down. So uh, so test driven development is also called uh, test first development. Um, so I think I'm going to coin a new phrase: test soon after development. But that would be T sad, so that wouldn't be very good. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I find it hard to adhere to test driven, and and also if you're if you're like learning some new technology and you you don't even know how the API works, and so um, I mean, the, yeah, I again the, the the people who really preach TDD are are nothing. I wouldn't want them to hear me say that, but I, I think does that answer your question? Yeah, so maybe there's some flexibility in that you can yeah. probe around probe around a little bit and then write some tests and then write right. out a full implementation. And, and I sort of find that when I'm when I'm cheating, um, that I'm I've still got I've still got the test in the back of my mind. So I think the test-driven development kind of mindset kind of helps me when I'm not truly writing the test first because I'm not sure on the syntax. But I still got the mi in mind. I'm, I'm trying to find something that once I write it, I can make a quick test for it. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, other questions? Um, so, as someone who's working on a, as part of a contributor to a large scale open Sorry, source. Can you hold it a little closer? Yeah. So, as someone who's working um, as a contributor to a large scale open source project, um, what I found as someone who's been writing tests uh, for a non test driven development approach, uh, it's like. Uh, I would ideally, and I think many other people on part of the team would, would want to go towards test-driven development, but we started the project yeah. uh, just by developing for a while, so it's kind of like playing catch-up. Um, and one thing beyond just writing tests for already existing code is uh, trying to push towards a more, like, a, when the community makes like a pull request or something, how can we uh, incentivize people to provide tests with their code as well? Because I, it's kind of like um, when you get someone who wants to contribute, uh, it might come across as somewhat like if you ask. Uh, okay, so I think so. I think I get the question. For so tests, you're, yeah. So you're you're saying okay, you're part of the open source community. I, so are you a moderator or you're just a contributor? Just a contributor. Okay. Um, so, I mean, so really it's, it's kind of up to the moderators to encourage that. And um, I, so I, I'm not a moderator myself. Is anybody here an open source moderator? Okay. Um, so you know, I think you can when you're when you're looking at the pull request. If it doesn't have tests uh, that that test what you do, I mean, I would uh, again, since I'm not a moderator, maybe I'm stepping into hot water. But I'd say, okay, this is great. It looks like the code works, but where are your tests? So that's not quite encouraging test-driven development, but at least it's encouraging. Testing. So I don't. I don't know. Can you speak? Do you mind speaking to that? Do you have an idea on how to do that? Yeah. Uh, do you have to do the microphone? 
Uh, yeah, we, we often, um, I'm part of the Foreman uh, community, and uh, I work on an open source project called Catello, um, and one of the maintainers of it, and we often will ask people, please, can you please ask, add tests for this? Okay. And, and then long-term contributors expect that, now they're thinking about the tests before they even you know, start implementing something and maybe using TDD. So you can kind of enforce that in your community. And, and uh, is the open source project that you're working on, is it kind of written with test-driven development or is it kind of... I wouldn't say strictly, but I think we have the mindset that you want to... The code should be tested. The majority okay. of the code should be tested. And, yep. and part of it, I do think, if you're checking that there's that there's tests every time you check in, usually check-ins are small pieces of work. So maybe that kind of encourages at least the, the TSAT approach that I was talking about either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, hi, Ethan. So what about, uh, how can we use, uh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. So what about the legacy codes? How, how effective? Legacy code, did yes. you say? Yes. So um, legacy code is a lot trickier. And so it depends on the extent of the change that you're making. Um, but what you want to do is, OK, I got this huge, ugly chunk of legacy code, and I need to add this piece of functionality. Is there a way that I can safely uh, untangle the, the threads of that piece? <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to use a spaghetti analogy. Um, is, is there a way that I can um, isolate that functionality so that it, so that it is more modular? Oh, yeah, that's something else I wanted to say about the previous slide. Is there a way that I can isolate it so that the piece that I'm modifying is more modular? So it might be that you've got, you know, a thousand lines of code, and maybe there's a hundred lines in the middle that you want to change how it behaves. So maybe you put that into a function, and then where the legacy code... Uh, originally was executing that, you call the function. And so you're in a little bit danger of regression, but if you do it carefully, you know, and you might not have tests that everything that executes that, but if you, if you can figure out how to isolate it, put that one piece in a sub-function, and then you can start writing automated tests for that. That's, that's one piece about legacy code. Um, the other piece with legacy code is, uh, there's, there's something called uh, golden master testing, or uh, uh, I forget the other term for it right now. But the idea with that is, um, and again, you, ha you have to have a system at least, I mean, some legacy systems, there's like no entry in with the APIs at all. But presuming that you've got entries that it's API based at least, um, the idea with with uh, with uh, this type of testing is you um, you create tests that test all like tons of combinations of values, uh, and then you record what the results are of those values, and you save that and you call that the golden master. Um, and you can, I've even seen this done even with like screenshots, that's kind of interesting, but uh, you know, more, it's more like your, your tests create a text output, and then you make some changes and you run it again, and you see if you get uh, the same test output. And then maybe you find out, well, this, this, this value really should be seven, or maybe you add uh, you know, some, some new features. So you can then say, OK, I've changed this. These are the changes to the golden master. Am I OK with those? And then you make that the new golden master. Um, other questions? Do we have a question from this side of the room? Are you sure? No. Um, one up here. I don't know why this went dark. 
Hello, it's a nice talk. Uh, I don't have a question exactly, but I have a remark to make based on the earlier question of incentivizing uh, the TDD in open source communities. Okay. I think a great idea would be to have badges, like Fedora community has badges. Have so what, sorry? Badge, an okay. imaginary badge. Okay. So yeah. one thing, uh, it should, uh, let's say it's a shield-like looking icon with a TDD champion written on it, right? Yeah. It's it does not need to be a physical badge. Yeah. So one thing I can tell you is that developers are suckers for a good badge, so they will they will eventually fight for it. Yeah. Um, actually, and th thank you for that. And I also wanted to mention here on this. This was more about the legacy. So this is this is a great thing to strive for. You know, so you're spending most of your time on the cheap things. Um, if you've got a system that's not well architected, that uh, um, where 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 uh, you know you've got various dependencies between the different objects, things are intertwined and stuff like this. This is a, this is a more dangerous strategy because it's going to be it, it, it may be that it's in a lot of the interactions between the different things. So you might need to spend more of your time here, or maybe you don't even have APIs, and maybe you need to spend more of your time up here. So um, this is, uh, this strategy kind of presumes that you've got a well-architected system uh, without, without a lot of uh, surprises. And if it was perfectly architected, you know, you could probably do almost all of this and just a tiny bit of this and a tiny bit of that. Um, but I think that that's rare. Um, okay, let's see how much time do I have? Five minutes. Any other questions? All right, great. Uh, I'll give you five minutes back. And again, my contact information and information about that user group is on the back table. So uh, thanks a lot, everybody. It was great. Good questions.